Welcome, guys, to the Ben and Tony podcast. Today, we're joined by Gillian Kowalchuk. From escaping civil war to experiencing an incident of sexual harassment in London, Gillian has developed one of the strongest senses of personal and civic responsibility out of anyone I've ever met. And she's applied it too, most lately in the founding and leading of the award winning startup Safe in the City. So many people start with big, lofty goals when it comes to making a difference. But what I love about Gillian's story is that she started by making small, impactful changes to the immediate world around her, and then she worked up from there. I left our conversation with a deep conviction that the world is a better place because Gillian is in it. And one lesson that I took that I'll try to apply to my life is start small in your immediate environment and make positive impact there. Hey, it's Anthony. Uh, Jill Kowalchuk. It's crazy to hear the story of how living in Yemen at an early age and then having to dramatically escape the country has shaped Jill. While her time there was bittersweet, it's created such a deep sense of purpose within Jill's soul. I really latched on to certain phrases that Jill said, that she tackles problems that we don't really like talking about, like sexual health, harassment, sexual education. To quote Jill again, she's had a clear picture of the injustice and inequality in the world and has dedicated her life to making things better. Jill has a kind heart, And you should be able to take some inspiration from the way she's been able to give back to her community at every single stage of her life. It was a wonderful conversation. Today, we have a wonderful guest joining us on the What's Next podcast. We have Jillian Kowalchuk. So Jill is an award-winning entrepreneur and is the founder and CEO of this amazing company called Safe in the City, which is a technology designing safety in digital and physical spaces. Jill is a very, very well sought after speaker, business coach, consultant. She's lived in a lot of different countries, had an interesting life story, has had some great success in the UK and also around Europe. And we're really excited to hear her perspective on things today. So welcome, Jill. Thank you so much for having me. Great, great. How, I'm, how... I'm so excited about the topics <laughs> you've learned. <laughs> I'm excited to dive in too. I feel like this is going to be difficult to keep short. So yeah, we'll do our oh, best. I th- I like you've had an interesting life, Jill. Um, can you tell us maybe from the beginning, like, at, at, at these moments of transition in your life, you know, we all, we all have very big moments that have shaped our childhood, but from your perspective, what, what is the big one that we could start off with here today? Yeah, I think we're certainly connected on some of those interesting points. Um, and that's kind of how, yeah, we got to know each other and form this amazing friendship and, you know, hopefully soon to follow with you, Ben. Um, Lifelong friendship all here. Exactly. Yeah. Virtual. It's the COVID way now, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think, um, so originally I was born in Canada. Um, and yeah, it was kind of that time when oil and gas was really picking up. I was uh, born in Calgary, which was kind of the oil and gas center of Canada. And um, my father got a job right out of grad school Um in like a placement in Yemen and originally he was just going to go move over there for and years like an indeterminate number of um, years um, and my mom was like no we're gonna go with you and so yeah I was um, I'm the middle child of uh, three um, I, I was about five years old when we first moved and really formed a lot of my early memories. Um, I think as a kid, you just really soak up the people you're around. So I didn't really remember much of Canada, um, but I certainly remember a lot of Yemen. Uh, We were there for about five years. um, And we were able to travel quite a lot. Um, When we first moved there, we were one of the first expat family um, to arrive in Aden. Yemen, which is like right on the Red Sea, if you look at a map. Um, And so there was like no tourism, there was really no foreigners. We lived at a hotel for 
the first year um, that we were kind of moved around a little bit. Uh, we lived in like a villa in the center of the city. Um, and then eventually over the years, there were more, um, I guess, as the project evolved, um, there were more families that came over until we were moved then to kind of a compound. And yeah, it was it was amazing. We I can't remember how many cities off the or countries off the top of my head, but we went to all sorts of places: um, India, you know, Saudi Arabia, Oman, um, Dubai, or UAE, Malaysia, Singapore, Australia. Like we we just kind of traveled and were homeschooled, and we just thought this was a normal life of making friends with you know, hospitality staff or, you know, other people we, we met and um, along the way. Um, so, so and just quick, quick question yeah. on that, because this is a very monumentous thing that affects someone like, and you know, I, my childhood was similar ish in the sense that lived in a lot of different countries growing up. But what I, what I also think is interesting is the role of the parents in making this stuff happen, right? Like, was this your first mm -hmm. time your dad had actually lived outside of Canada or had, was he very well traveled? like was it a tough decision did he because it's not like oh let's uproot the family and have some fun in london for a few years right this is like quite a big decision that is off the beaten track yeah definitely i don't really remember um you know their decision making process i i don't think i had any involvement in it um five-year-old you're putting your <laughs> <down. laughs> i did remember we actually had to um we had to get <laughs> that, that sounds bad get rid of your dog but like we had to um yeah basically give away our dog um, that part that was tragic. really tough yeah. i do remember that um it was to like a wonderful farm and yeah it was yeah she was quite happy our dog cindy but uh yeah no my father was from a really small town in um manitoba and my mom was kind of born and raised in calgary so they had really zero experience of going and living abroad i think my mom traveled to germany once with her yeah. brother like so this was a huge decision that they did take and i mean in contrast to Canada, like Yemen is one of the most third world countries you could go to. Yeah. Like it's one of the poorest, one of the, you know, most corrupt and, you know, gender equality. There's just so many aspects to it that are very quite different from, you know, the privileged space. Not to say that it isn't a fantastic culture and history and, and people, um, you know, not to kind of um, paint it in a negative light, but, um, yeah, it was a it was a big change, and I I still think back to it like how much of a different person I would have been if it had not been for that move and those experiences. What what how do you, you how do you find like that process of adjusting as like a, a five year old? How did you make friends? You know, what was it like immersing yourself in such a different culture? Yeah, I think so at the beginning we really didn't have like any other kids like our, our family is pretty protective of us um you know for the first little bit because you know we couldn't just run around with the yemeni kids like we wanted to like i remember watching from our hotel there was kids that would play football all the time and just you know dying to kind of go and use my arabic and go speak and play with them um and so it really strengthened the relationship between my siblings and I. We were all two years apart and um, yeah, just became each other's like friends. I don't remember fighting with them. I don't remember. I think we kind of had this knowledge that we're like, well, this is all we got. So let's make the best of it. Um, and we also had, you know, a lot of adults. Um, so I think we kind of befriended a lot of adults in a way of a friendship until we did eventually have more kids um, join the compound and join the company um, and, and then get a lot more exposure to Yemeni people as we kind of settled in. Well, how, how do you like, I guess, summarize the impact it's had in your life? Because I think what's, what's always important is if someone has lived in another country that makes you more open-minded, more worldly as like, a an obvious thing but also you lived in a place that's it, it's not i don't think i know anyone who's lived in yemen personally apart from you so it's not it's I not like absolutely no one. I, I as far as i know right i can't think of anyone i know who's yeah. been in yemen 
Yeah, it's it's really like this mysterious place that I, I feel really lucky that I'm I have exposure. I have, you know, so many experiences from it. But um I don't even know how to it it was pivotal. Like it it completely changed who I was. Um and not only I think the experience and you know, again as a child, like I I really looked fondly on our time there. Um and it grew my imagination, like it grew my ability to connect and understand lots of different types of people. I was reading through my mom's uh, journal a few years ago and just, again, the types of questions of like, you know, poverty and, you know, why do these things exist? Like really kind of understanding that there was this injustice happening um and that certainly kind of guided a lot of the paths that took me from there onward um and then certainly the breaking point was um when unfortunately there's there was just ongoing conflict there's just a lot of yeah different things going on including today there's um uh, a, a civil war is still going on in in yemen um and yeah, we had to leave um, really suddenly. It was quite traumatic experience. Um, it wasn't something that we were really, there was kind of like some, you know, bubbling of conflicts, but it's kind of in those places, there's always these types of things that you have to monitor these types of risks and um, yeah, kind of violence and, and extremism and, and terrorism. Um, but yeah, that was certainly quite, a traumatic and and again shifting experience to again be equalized to you know i guess refugee status to a certain extent and that we had to you know flee with other people we ended up um our compound ended up getting bombed um same with the airport so we had to look at getting um in a boat we we did this, that with this was member. after you oh, left wow. or but like what was the bombing like literally while you were there it was yeah it was go uh, while we were there so it all happened really suddenly like within a day or two like we were had to pack our backpacks like um i kind of remember at the door my mom had like some of our suitcases she's like oh we'll, we'll like pack up and we'll get some of the stuff like the company will you know come back for it um you know i remember struggling to like i was like a stuffed animal person like little girls so i was like really wanted to carry all of my stuffed animals and i could only really pick one um and yeah wow. taking just our backpack of stuff and getting out of the house um and luckily like in time um yeah it's actually one of the things of again maybe pointing to my childhood later on i think i was in grade six it was like a show and tell and i brought my the insurance video of like our house like and how it got bombed and destroyed wow. as like kind of my telltale like which i didn't think of as impressive but i thought maybe again people could understand that there's like these types of things that people have lived through and you know that there are kind of more important things than maybe winning a trophy or i can't remember at the time what my mindset of sharing that was but it's certainly pretty mature me. sixth grader though that's a pretty mature message for a sixth grader <laughs> like, I, I don't think i would have thought of that yeah. yeah that's crazy i mean when you're in calgary the biggest fluctuation you would have seen was in the change of the oil prices presumably so you know yeah leaving your home packing your bags i mean were you kind of aware of what was going on around you? Do you feel like you knew it was kind of bombs or was it just something wasn't safe? No, at that point I was about nine and I certainly knew from, you know, the adults reactions, like, you know, what was going on. You, I think everyone has this instinct. So it's really, you know, hard to, you know, think that children are just kind of um that they wouldn't even if they don't remember maybe some things that they don't have that kind of imprinted within them no. um so yeah no i was i was definitely scared and you know quite yeah traumatized <laughs> for a while of figuring out you know what had happened and processing like now we're in in canada i mean that was that took us a couple of weeks to do that um but yeah, it was just, it was just a, such a drastic shift of life that really um, made me feel really unsettled in Canada. I didn't really, you know, I, I, I'd made a home there with my family and friends and life. Um, 
which is very different from what it was in yeah. Canada. I, I think what's what's fascinating too about this is like the role of the parents, okay. right? Like I can imagine if I was your dad in that situation, I would be obviously a, a fearful for my own safety, but worried about my kids so much in a situation like that. And I can only imagine what, like, what do you do in that situation? Does he just try to calm you down and be like, it's all good, Jill, nothing, like this is, this is all just, um, you ever seen that, that, um, that Roberto Benigni movie, Life is Beautiful? It's about this like- Yes, well, yeah. yes. So, like, and, and it's, cause like- Oh, it's, that's it's, a great right? movie. So it's like the dad is trying to make his son like not think about World War II by pretending like it's a game. And I just like mm -hmm. think like that kind of um, thing, you know, I mean, I'm not a dad, but I'd imagine like, it's such an important thing where the way you deal with your kids in a time of crisis, um, there's so many like, it's a lot of pressure to that. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And I, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't know if they, you know, how you could really handle that situation. I think they really just wanted to kind of move on. And um, I think that was a bit, you know, challenging to just kind of let's resettle. Let's, you know, be grateful that we're, we're here, we're safe and, you know, like kind of think about the next kind of steps ahead. Um, and I felt like probably out of all of my family, I was a lot more of the one that was stuck back there. Like mm -hmm. I had a lot more of the, the memories and, the kind of um yeah pieces that i was like yeah. i want to drive like go back and i want to you know um you know figure out how we could stop something like this um so it definitely you know grew in me this sense of injustice about the world the kind of um inequalities that it existed and i you know always was looking at careers of you know whether it was a being a doctor or being um you know, a, a public health professional, which is, I guess, where I ended up um, now tech. Uh, but yeah, just the seedlings of all of it really ties back to that experience for me. Um, yeah. Hey, that's, that's amazing. So well, what kind of, how did that manifest later? I'd love to kind of explore, you know, where that took you, that feeling of injustice. Yeah, I've, it's, um, it's certainly, I mean, as a kid, you can't, we well, can do a lot now. You can do a lot more now than I think in the nineties. Um, but uh, yeah, I, what was some of the things? I created an environmental club um, nice. in my school. <laughs> nice. I actually had started that in Yemen. It was just basically picking up with like some people from my school. Our school was like, 20 people but we would go pick up garbage from the beach uh, which became a recycling program that I helped um, set up in grade six um, and at yeah age 12 I heard I first heard the word vegetarian I was like what is this because I want to be it and by my 13th birthday I was allowed to make that decision so I've been uh, vegetarian now vegan for most of my life um and then certainly my pursuit of uh psychology was not only kind of to figure out myself and what was going on but figure out other people and how i could help and then i think hey, that that's, evolved that's, that's way before vegetarianism was cool yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh it was so way before and you know that was in in calgary which again is kind of known as the kind of texas of um, <laughs> <laughs> so like vegetarian was not a thing it, I was again just bombarded with this these level of barriers and you know stigma and debate and you know it's interesting looking back that I'm like why you know why have I set up all of these things yeah. but I think again that makes like you fighter. equipped to do so many bigger things as you kind of move through the navigate the smaller ones um, so so it sounds like uh, the first sort of major transition in your life was the experience in Yemen, both getting there and then the the way which the way in which you had to leave kind of dramatically like it is sound like it's from a film what what was like the next big transitional moment in your life like I know you mentioned death, loss, and travel or something like that those are some pretty pretty intense words there like can we unpack <laughs> what each of those mean 
I know. I feel like, you know, don't let the pink hair fool you. I'm probably <laughs> pretty, or smile. I'm like, I'm a pretty intense person, but I think that makes you the happiest yeah. types. Um, but yeah, I think, um, so my mom, um, relatively shortly after, I guess I was 11, um, first got diagnosed with cancer. Um, so that was, uh, series of um you know between surgery and chemo um a few times throughout the years um her being very ill and just living with that as a family um that was really tough um and unfortunately she she lost the battle um when i was 19 mm -hmm. um so that was a really major hit um into kind of adulthood and yeah. figuring out a lot of stuff um and shortly after like a month after um my grandmother who was also quite a core person in my life um died in an accident which um really unfolded a lot of um i guess yeah trauma in our family and um unfortunately at at that time like um my relationship with my father was was quite strained it was always quite distant um but more or less like, um, yeah, he kind of left our lives um, through his kind of decision and, and different choices. So yeah, I was 1920, I kind of lost both parents and University? figured out. Like what was? Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah, I was in um, second year university. Yeah. In Canada. In Canada, yeah. And that did also steer a lot of my decisions. Like I had wanted to go to, uh, you know, schools abroad, but with my mom being sick, I just figured I'd, I'd go somewhere closer and just, you know, kind of stay the course. I had a lot bigger aspirations, but I felt like, no, I needed to be here and just kind of, um, yeah, figure out later on doing those big yeah. things. Um, and then, yeah, I think that really just, in a weird way, gave me permission um, to just travel and and explore the world. So kind of almost going back to that time of of Yemen and us in our earlier age. Um, so I did a lot of traveling, all um, I guess solo traveling. I move. My first move was to Scotland for university. I got a scholarship uh, to finish um, my third year. Um, or yeah and then once i graduated i moved to new zealand <laughs> then i moved to australia japan back to australia how do you um, how do you decide because like and all in, these places yeah, yeah. Frame. <laughs> like why, why new zealand it really <laughs> why scotland like there are a lot of options you have here. yeah but i mean a lot of it was guided i i really i i want to kind of be like i was a little bit finger in the air and letting kind of life unfold for me. Um, Scotland was crazy. Like I had applied for the study abroad, but it was in Finland and Australia. Um, and I didn't get into either of them or there were different options. I think I did get into Finland, but I got a full scholarship to go to Scotland. So I was like, hell yeah, like I'm not gonna <laughs> pay for, you know, university for a year. That sounds great. Um, so yeah that was um definitely got me exploring a lot of europe in between school and um then moving back um basically i my boyfriend and i at the time were going to travel southeast asia on my graduation and um that relationship didn't work out so i had all this money saved up i really wanted to travel um i had a good one of my best friends um, who was working at the University of Otago in Dunedin. And she's like, why don't you just come here and um, you could, you know, stay on the couch for as long as you want. Um, I'll try to get you a job if, if that's helpful. And I was like, yes, I think being on the opposite side of the world to figure out my shit would be a really good idea. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that was kind of some of it. Um, Japan, Australia was also something similar. A, a friend of mine from Canada moved over to Sydney to work. Um, she was moving back and she was like, my visa was kind of coming up, uh, which I could have extended, uh, but I was kind of ready for the next thing. And um, 
yeah, she was like, do you want my job? You can have my, uh, basically like have like her life, <laughs> her apartment. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of within a month. I was, I was living in Sydney. I was working um, at her job in hospitality. Um, and similar to Japan, my brother ended up going there and working. So he got me a job and within a month I was on a plane to Japan, like didn't know how to speak the language, didn't really know much about what I was getting myself into, but kind of was very much in this time in my life where I was guided by, I guess, opportunities that felt right. Did it feel like um, things were happening guided by something out of your control? Like, was it just like, I, it, 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 life had come to you rather than you deciding what you wanted to do? Or was it, I, I just feel like people make all these big decisions, right? Like, especially when it comes to moving. Like moving, I think, seems very innocuous, but it has a huge impact on you. I mean, I moved to New Zealand a few months ago inadvertently, and I think I'm still processing that. Um, but uh, I think sometimes you, you wonder why things happen for a reason. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't really, I felt that it was in between me being ready to leave and open to seeing what unfolded. Um, like I did get a job offer in South Korea, but it was like, I was just new to New Zealand and I was kind of like, I don't think I've spent enough time here. Um, so there was definitely this kind of, um, were different things at play of, um, and, you know, probably budget, I can't remember at the time, like, would a factor in. Um, so yeah, it, it felt very freeing, though. I tried to make it as freeing as possible from, you know, a lot of probably how I was expected or um, had lived in, in other kind of parts of my life. Um, so this was really just exploring myself, um, you know, what I wanted to do, what was the meaning behind my life, as probably cliche as that sounds, um, and really doing that through exploration, through different people I had exposures to or relationships of various sorts with. Um, and yeah, I, I don't regret it. I think it was probably one of the best decisions I made. Yeah. And it sounds like everywhere you, you, you go, you kind of pick up small to large projects of things the way you can kind of make an impact was were you doing that while you were traveling across all these different places yeah i think i mean volunteering was always super important to me um and i think my mom and my grandmother especially um my grandmother had 12 children she also wow. volunteered like with i think a hundred different organizations throughout her lifetime she won wow. uh woman of the year in canada like wow. she's just such an Woo. incredible woman yeah um she also had a job um she had i think there's like 49 grandchildren or something like i have a huge family on um, my dad's side and um yeah i think that really um as well as my mom really inspired me to that's like where you connect with a lot of people you can kind of get into the culture by helping out really like yeah. um so i i certainly did that quite a bit um and i still really encourage people to do it especially when you're kind of looking at career changes or something you're maybe curious about um it's such an easy way to be like hey you don't have to pay me i'll learn i'll figure it out i'll add value and how i can um so yeah in new zealand i ended up working um at um as a, as a social worker um, for people living with uh, disabilities, like intellectual disabilities. And it was such a rewarding job. Um, again, just really breaking down these, these molds or shapes of what people are, you know, oh, these people are, are stupid and they need help. And actually coming into the brilliance and, and beauty of these people and, and in their lives was really, awesome like I still learn so much and I helped one woman publish a book like they weren't you know doing things uh whereas maybe some other people I worked with their mindset was a little bit different to mine um 
I also, yeah, it helped. Um, I was really into makeup, uh, like special effects makeup, but also just makeup for beauty. So um, yeah, I volunteered to kind of do different nights out with, um, especially with the women. Um, and some of them so had never yeah. worn makeup and like taken photos and like gone karaoke. And it was just like nice to just like, for them, like having, I think I was 23 or something, you know, probably not also having um, someone of my age, a lot of them were, you know, in their 40s or, or older, um, like exposure to maybe someone cool, maybe someone interesting from a different, like from a oh, random awesome. place yeah. in Canada. Um, I also, which I'm really proud of, I, um, this helped kind of steer, I think the early parts of Safe in the City um, was, again, this kind of, um, questioning and, and passion towards, um, you know, bringing conversation to areas that, um, or visibility to issues that, that are often neglected or ignored or just continue to kind of recycle the same way and, and really harm people. Um, so through uh, that, I had mostly my kind of, um, the people I supported um, were women that, um, and unfortunately a, a few of them uh, contracted some pretty serious sexually transmitted infections and diseases because, again, this was just something, although we, we really had controlled a certain degree over their bank accounts and, um, you know, their family and working relationships, medical doctors, even kids and childcare, but nobody would talk to them about sex and like health, like safe sex and and sexual education and and that it's okay and that you you know these are your your rights and and you know freedoms with it like so anyways i ended up setting up um a sexual health workshop because it was something i again volunteered where was this, sir? University. Was this in, new, in new zealand in new zealand okay. yeah so i created some videos that i would be amazing if anyone could find them um which got shared into this um it was called the community care trust um yeah, but I basically taught um, uh, HIV sexual health information, uh, sexual health and STI information to um, yeah to to the care workers and to the um, to our clients um, and helped ar arrange and set up like a lot more relationships with sexual clinics and and things like that to help support that. So yeah, that was something I was really proud of, and again, just kind of made me question like again a lot of this is through our social construction when we can really change that i i so agree i think one thing when i'm thinking about people always have these kind of you know big lofty goals of okay i want to end world hunger or when it comes to you know sexually transmitted disease i want to make sure that every single person across emerging countries has access to condoms or education but i think the thing that people often overlook is that these problems are often in a much smaller way in your local community. And mm -hmm. I love that you've always seemed to have started within the, okay, the place that you are. There are certain issues around you and you look to solve those first and then expand from there. Yeah, absolutely. And it was still me figuring out a lot of this stuff. Like, again, I got trained in university. We went to high schools to deliver this sexual health um, classes. Um, but yeah, it was like a skill set that was like, hey, this is unfolding before my eyes. I have these tools. I'm, you know, someone that I think can talk quite frankly and openly and non judgmentally about these issues. So um, yeah, it was something that I felt really proud. And hopefully, next time I go visit, I'll go check yeah. out if it's still there, yeah. the library and uh, the connections and the training. Um, hopefully, I somebody's built on that. I'm really curious, like the work you've done in sexual health, I mean, obviously it's focused on New Zealand at the time, but considering that you've done work, I know you've traveled a lot around Africa, Asia, the Middle East, is, have you observed differences in how the topic is addressed in these different countries? Or maybe you've, your involvement's mainly been focused on New Zealand? Like, just love to know, like internationally, how is that topic becoming more relevant or how has that changed the way people talk about it over the last five, 10 years? Oh man. That's it. I Big, think. Lofty question <laughs> yeah, really great question. Of course, I was expecting this. <laughs> um, I think in general, it's still like massively under discussed and still a really big taboo 
subject in a lot of cultures. There's a lot of controls, there's a lot of abuse, there's a lot hidden. Um, and, yeah. and it's really unfair. Like this is, again, information that everyone should have a right to and understand it and make choices um, you know, that are informed by their own health and other people's health that could be at risk. Um, so in, in general, I felt like it was, it, I would be more in the circles, um, again, maybe talking about veganism, talking about, you know, environmentalism, talking about sex, like, I don't know, I must have a, a magnet of things people don't want to talk about. I'm like, let's talk about that. That's a great position to be in, by the way. <laughs> those are good people. The people who are talking about things most people are afraid to talk about, those are good people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But um, I think in general, I, again, I would just try to have more of those um, conversations where, where I could. Um, it was kind of with my psychology degree, I was interested in pursuing, you know, sexual health research um, or, you know, sexology, I guess it was called at the time, or sex therapy, sexual education. I was just like, this is a massively neglected area. There's so much content and, you know, not thought leadership and, you know, exposure that people need to this. So it was, and it, it could be fun. Like it, it could be a fun topic too. It doesn't have to be always so serious. Like, and you could look at it from so many different angles of, you know, even childhood development and, it, you know, kind of all of the changes that you go through. Yeah. Um, so that was something I was very kind of curious about. And again, it ended up later on kind of moving me into public health, um, which is where, again, I focused on HIV and, and sexually transmitted infections. So ended up there eventually. <laughs> I think so, so many people kind of know um, that they want to be involved with some sort of kind of civic pursuit or charitable pursuit or, you know, be part of a cause that's bigger than or more purposeful than just the work that they're doing. Um, it's kind of a side pursuit. You know, what, what kind of advice would you give to folks who are looking for something like this? Where should they start? Um, how can they get involved? You know, what are some of the routes in? And how should they actually, one, one actually interesting question to laden you with questions um, <laughs> is, uh, you know, how do you find the thing that feels most purposeful to you? Great question. Yeah, really good questions. Um, so, I mean... We're not expecting you to have all the answers. <laughs> yeah. Go on. Go on, Jill. <laughs> I think certainly it's just start small, start where you feel comfortable. Like even if it's, you know, following someone who is doing that work on Instagram as like a starting point, just take a small micro action towards that thing that is sparking your interest or, you know, you know, makes you more compassionate. I think that also was a really interesting thing. You know, we talk a lot about passion, um, but I think also it's compassion that really drives people that empathy and that like, you know, frustration and maybe even anger sometimes of that can also really drive you into that direction of where to find purpose um, and get behind those bigger things that you're not going to be able to solve in one person's work alone. Um, I think, you know, there's so many tools available and, and there's so many ways that you can find out about them. Um, but I think just you know, finding the people that are doing those things is really helpful because having that role model, having, knowing that there is someone else doing it is really, I think, critical to that step. And then just, you know, feeling out how you feel comfortable of like, you know, what, how you educate yourself on that, you know, how do you eventually gain the confidence to speak about that? How can you relate your personal story to that? Mm -hmm. um, I think they're all kind of these building blocks that um, you have to go through in order to kind of understand that. But it really does start with figuring out yourself. And if that makes you need to go on a, you know, rampage around the world for a couple of years, like it was for me, <laughs> then do that. Like, I mean, not having a particular direction, I think is where most people feel that they are. And yeah. that, that is really sad. And I think it, it does require work. Like it doesn't just kind of happen overnight. You, you do have to put in that groundwork to figure out and test and experiment these different types of lives or different types of 
people or you know work or lifestyles that you want to be in and again i feel quite lucky of being a little bit of a jill of all trades of trying it, them all <laughs> maybe this is uh the right time to talk about you setting up safe in the city uh in terms of that being like you know your number one focus right now and considering all the different things you've done you've, you've kind of narrowed in at least for now i'd imagine you know like your number one priority is this company uh as and and like any major thing we we take on it's based on the sum of all our experiences and our interests of their, everything that happened beforehand so could you talk about what safe in the city is how it came about and yeah everything about it <laughs> amazing yeah and i think this is something i um i shared on my tedx talk which was also really interesting um journey to go on in myself of being like how did i end up here and, yeah. you know like can we find that tedx talk by the way yes it's called equality by design um so you can google it um yeah. but um yeah it was a really interesting process to kind of go back to be like how did i end up here and to see that there was these you know mixtures along the way of like this kind of makes sense of why i am here um but yeah, Safe in the City um, started when I moved to uh, London. Um, I, as I mentioned, I pursued my graduate studies in public health and epidemiology um, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, had been working in a couple years before I decided, hey, I'm gonna come back and land and, and pursue um, I, at the time, again, sexual health um, in a public health context between, I was hoping between kind of Africa and, and Europe. Um, and yeah, it was, um, it was a weird time because the Brexit referendum happened. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of ugliness that was really coming up in the UK. Um, and, you know, I managed to, you know, get into some you know interesting groups and do different things but um as i was kind of navigating that metaphorically and and uh, literally um you know i started to recognize that there were a lot of gaps in technology and this was something that was always of interest to me um especially with some of my work in uganda with um young people living with hiv again they're drawn just like other young people around the world to using tech and we're like why isn't there you know again ways even with you know low or no you know kind of wi-fi and and different high-tech uh solutions but there there are ways that you can engage people in the you know platforms that they're already using so it was always an interest of mine of like how do i incorporate public health and and tech into kind of doing something quite powerful and scalable in the world and yeah, I kind of started by getting lost and using my navigation app. It was Google Maps at the time, um, following the kind of fastest route, which took me into a really unfortunate experience um, through an alleyway where two kitchen staff um, were on a smoke break. Um, they quickly kind of escalated a situation where I was just walking past, but essentially threatened to sexually assault me in this alleyway because they thought they could get away with it. Um, it was, I felt like quite, you know, in a helpless situation, no one was really around to help me. Um, it ended up just being threats that they were probably getting some sort of kick out of. And, you know, I was obviously quite scared, got out of that situation, met my friend um, in London at this restaurant and, told her what happened she had other experiences similar to that um and i really just couldn't get out of my head like there's other people following this app like there's you know millions of people on google maps how can you know what if i was able to leave a mark on the map or tell people what happened like i didn't necessarily know think to call the police i didn't necessarily you know want to go to the business and be like hey these are your staff and just kind of like ruin my night i was already kind of traumatized and just wanting to like you know not have to deal with this and again these are incidents if you speak to a lot of different women that are just part of our kind of day-to-day -day lives um so 
it really, yeah, it was kind of, again, thinking back of like people I may have left behind and I kind of, again, maybe link that analogy to maybe Yemen of mm. being, you know, leaving other people behind. But this time I felt like there was more I could have done. So that was kind of the inspiration or the light bulb moment of Safe in the City. I'm like, can construct a navigation platform that could help you, you know, stay alert to emergency safety crises, um, but then also, um, you know, give people the ability, like empower them to know that they can report these different types of incidents, whether they're, you know, criminal or whether no they're normalized and just experienced on a massive scale, but really do impact um, how you feel or, or kind of your well-being. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the genesis of Safe in the City. Um, so I quit my job. I was working at UCL as a, as a researcher. Um, I started this as a non-tech founder, like alone um, navigating the London tech scene. Just does feel kind of mental to me now that I, that I did all this. But I had so much validation for this idea. And the more people I told, the more people were like, this is incredible like this is like a game changing type of like platform and idea that could really help yeah. equalize and shape things like give back the voice to the citizens of the city and you know make it a measurable difference that has to be made to make these cities safer because we can now make these ties into the economic impacts into you know the kind of social impacts into impacts to business um and yeah that was um where it kind of started and um that was in 2016 that i had the idea like in, in winter time and within a couple months i registered the company i um, made a lot of big changes in my life to to do this um and yeah, now have a team of seven between London and Berlin, which we launched in both places. We've worked now with some major brands like Uber. Um, we've done reports with UN Women because we're very much driven to be a social business, like a business, I, I believe, of the future um, that's you know profitable and sustainable financially, but also able to make a demonstrable difference. And yeah, we have some pretty exciting new collaborations to come. I think with the sustainability lens of, again, personal safety through, you know, walking or cycling or scooters or all these different uh, forms that um, are, again, beneficial to all of us, um, making sure that personal safety is not a factor that, you know, doesn't help people make those different choices that are better for the collective whole. I think it's a, we don't need to say anything about like how important this is and how this should be kind of self-evident, right? So, um, you know, I would love to know how, how would you get on the app? It's just available on the app store. Um, and then, you know, when I'm using the app as well, you know, am I, am I flagging incidents that I see so that everyone can see them on a kind of communal map? Like how does it work uh, when you're actually in practice? Yeah, so the app itself is, um only available in London and Berlin. It's something that we're working on. The website is open to the world, so you can report on the website. Um, but we particularly focused um, it being kind of a city by city rollout because of the relationships that we've established within those cities. Um, so within London, we work with the police um, to make sure that, again, we're getting official information related to safety incidents that they know about, but we're helping bridge the gap of what they don't know about. Um, and again, our focus has been based on my experience around sexual harassment, street harassment, but as, you know, over the years, more thousands of people have reported, there's just so many intersections of that, whether it's homophobia or racism, disability, like discrimination along with that. But the sexual threat, I think, is the overtone of, again, the the form of abuse um, versus maybe just a pure form of violence, um, because it does often relate to a hierarchy of power between genders. Um, so the app itself, um, you can download it. It works much the same as like Google Maps. You see kind of um, 
the where do you want to go uh, with some safety functionality. So if you are um, in an emergency, you can quickly access uh, 999. Um, we work in partnership with What Three Words as well, so making you have available the What Three Words address, so you're, it's very specific to where you are. And that's also someone, on, on a very small tangent. I saw someone got a What Three Words uh, tattoo the other day. Really? It was the first I had. Wow. Oh wow, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. But I guess hopefully they don't change it or sponsor, <laughs> yeah. sponsor these different update it'll be like that it. hockey yeah. tattoo that you get in the update public bathroom now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah um we also maintain that accuracy of if um that safety alert is related to where you are um in kind of where you want to get to your destination but also where are you along that route um and then the uh, reporting functionality is um, you can drag and drop it to wherever this uh, incident happened. And um, we have a categorical list um, for people to select from um, to help, again, shape them into categories. Because again, these are things that often people like, I don't even know if is this like this thing? Is it that thing? I haven't actually been educated on like, is that a bad thing? Is this just part of life. Um, so we have these categories and then a free text um, where you can describe the incident um, in a little bit more detail. And then also at the end of the walk, you can rate it on your um, view of safety um, for that particular route and journey. With that intention, again, being that um, the information gets aggregated, um, we can start to see the scorings of people's journeys, we can start to map out those trends over um, time of different types of incidents, like are these, um, you know, are these kind of um, taking photos um, around school children, like is there something that, again, we need to work in tandem with the police or have there been a series of sexual assaults um, that maybe people have escaped from but could be a lot more of a serious one? Or is this just, again, um, what we see on the platform is a lot of verbal um, harassment, which I feel like probably saying that maybe minimizes it, but there's some really terrifying things like you know, rape threats or, um, yeah, different violent um, attacks and described in a lot of detail often and sometimes even to like school children and, and things like that. So it does really get to the underbelly of what is happening in our cities. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity of, you know, being able to now change that, that we have that information that people have felt that they have um, a way to influence the kind of general um, area and potentially help other people along the way. So something you said a few minutes ago, <clears throat> I ha it's been stuck in my mind about how you mentioned that perhaps one of the reasons why you pursued your path is because kind of like Yemen, you didn't want to leave people behind. I think you said that when you were talking about safe in the city as well, like all the people who could have been left behind. And I think that's, that's really profound. Um, because it's, it kind of shows how, I mean, we've gone through in some ways, like in the short period of time, your life, uh, some major moments in your life. And, and it's like, you kind of connected yourself. I'm sure you probably, you know, it's obvious to you that this something that happened to you when you were very young, you can connect to today and why it matters mm -hmm. to you. And it's, it's a thing that perhaps will shape the rest of your life. Like making sure people aren't left behind because I mean, uh, I've been actually kind of recently, uh, learning more, a lot more about startups tech companies that deal with like issues that are let's say more specific to women um when it comes to health when it comes to safety like of course safe, safe in the city and to me this is like uh a blind spot for me because uh i might not be one of those people who's left behind in this situation but you have this level of empathy and understanding of the world that i might not have and that is and if you think about that applied to female founders all around the world who are, you know, the awesome Jills in other countries and cities uh, and the state of the world right now, um, that story of empathy, I think would resonate with a lot of people and the story of not leaving people behind will resonate with everybody who's listening to this. Thank you. And I think it's something that, yeah, I guess maybe Ben relating back to your question of purpose of, you know, if it is something that you have lived experience in, then I think that 
that relic from your life will always stay with you. And I think that was a little bit of the kind of gap when I was working in public health and HIV is, and especially when I went and lived in Uganda, again, I, I didn't want to be just like this kind of like white Western mm. well-educated person, like let me tell you. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I, I did my best not to, and I, I really think I, I did a good job of like letting, you know, other people lead and, and doing what I could um, with that. But there definitely was this kind of tension between myself of, you know, this isn't, this isn't my story. And I think once I found that, again, aspect of, you know, I've been in really scary situations like safety has a totally different meaning to me than other people as we have no idea of really understanding that without really engaging people and, and telling them it's valuable and, and showing them it's valuable by making changes to support that um and then of of course like being a woman like that's something i've <laughs> i've always had and and sexual harassment like sexual assault sexual violence is just been a constant in my life since I was a child and this is not abnormal it's one in three women that's like what two billion people like in the world like this is a very common thing that people experience and and not to say this doesn't happen to men but again if we can address the issue on the massive scale the the net benefit would be for everybody um and I certainly think that that has carried on and it's certainly you know a lot more now of you know the lgbtq community you know the trans community the um you know bl like black lives matter and like different racial groups and religious groups like just you know we all want to be safe we all want our loved ones to be safe you know this is just we can't advance the world without addressing these things and and that's really i guess at the heart of you know what i what i think you know innovation should be it should be at this center point of okay like there has to be you know a commercial entity like a commercial aspect of it coming in but it doesn't have to be for evil or you know it can actually serve a purpose of a real issue that uh, we need to change and we recognize needs to change Amazing. Well, uh, Jill, thank you so much. Um, it, it, do you have any last thoughts here on, uh, I guess, COVID, how maybe that has made you think about things, any new things you've got going on, uh, where should people find you? And those are like three different questions, but like wrap <laughs> them all up in however you'd like to. Um, I know, we've yeah, hit our answer. time. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think with COVID, just to kind of leave it with, um, you know, we are in a, a huge period of transition and challenge and people undoubtedly have, have been, you know, really uncomfortable to drastically loss and harmed through all of this. Um, but I think it also gives us a really good opportunity and we're already seeing that take shape of, um, you know, looking at maybe universal vaccinations and, and access to healthcare and, you know, sustainability and the environment, because we've seen what an impact it's, it's changed since, you know, some of the major contributors with us being home are, are gone or lessened. Um, the Black Lives Matter um, and Trans Lives Matter and all of these different campaigns that are really bringing to light these human rights that have been neglected for so long and questioning government systems and, and structures that, um, you know, that are just aren't working and we can see that happening on an epic scale. So I think, you know, this is the time for innovation. This is the time for the social entrepreneur. This is the time that we can really advance things, save ourselves and, and build back um, better. Awesome. So yeah, some of the things I guess um, I'm doing um, on the side, I guess um, I'm trying to link in that kind of resilient stoics, you know, for especially social entrepreneurs. I do coaching um, 
if anyone is interested, um, blending a little bit of psychology, obviously my experiences of being a, a tech founder and, and plugging in, um, yeah, different resources and networks I can connect uh, people to. Um, I also do a uh, number of different public speaking. So I mentioned my TEDx talk, but uh, if you're looking for a keynote speaker, I've been doing that uh, for a number of years around the world, something I'm really passionate about doing. Um, and if you're interested in veganism, I have something Ooh. on Instagram you can follow called Vegnostic. Um, if you break down the word, it's supposed to be, you know, bringing a little bit of agnostic principles and that there's not one ultimate truth. There's um, to vegan and vegetarianism to help people explore it in a lot more friendly and open um, and kind of dynamic way that it should be approached. Um, and of course, download Safe for the City, get in touch with us. Um, we're all over social media. Um, our website is safeforthecity.com. And yeah, I really would love to connect to the viewers, hear what you think, um, connect with you. If um, there's any way I can help, I'd love to get to know you more. Everybody, please reach out to Jill. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Ben and Anthony. Love that you're doing this. Hey, this has Thanks. been great. Um, the message is so much around personal responsibility. I think it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, in the TEDx talk, I was um, one of my advisors and, and friends, um, you know, he was like, playing on the Spider-Man quote. He's like, you're just such a responsible person, like not in a lame way. He's just like, you just carry this load of like, I want to change the world in my life. 